String amplitudes at tree level. So tree level for closed string means the complex plane or the Riemann sphere. The Riemann sphere can be projected to the complex plane by stereographic projection, where the point at infinity is the north pole. So the metric on the plane in this context can be thought of as this metric where a parameterizes the radius of the sphere. We can also think of it as a Riemann surface. So by that we mean that we have one patch, the coordinate z, and we introduce another patch, the coordinate u, that is valid close to the north pole, close to infinity, which z is not. If we think of patches, we think of transforming between them by a while transformation. So here the while transformation would be this, that would transform it from a flat metric to a non-flat metric. And because of this relation, given this, this for the most go as 1 over z absolute value to the fourth. And this uh, seems like it has a parameter, but it has effectively has no moduli. There are no metric moduli on the sphere. In fact, the Riemann-Roch theorem tells us that the number of conformal killing vectors minus number of metric moduli should be three times the Euler characteristic, which is six. If there are no metric moduli, there must be three plus three conformal killing vectors. If we have a holomorphic vector field in the U patch, which transforms to the Z patch, then it can at most grow as Z squared for it to be holomorphic also in the U patch. So we have three real parameters here, and we have another three real parameters in the anti version. So we get six real parameters, and that corresponds to the Mobius group. There's a lot of interesting mathematics here. The Mobius group can be thought of as, if you rotate this sphere, then it will induce some change in the coordinate z. You can understand this expression from that point of view also. If we have three plus three real parameters, we can fix three complex points. That means that we can map any three points to any points we want. So for a three-point function, we can map all three points to fixed numbers, so the result cannot depend on anything except the Jacobian to do the change of variables. For a four-point function, it would depend on one complex parameter left over after having fixed the first three. So let's take the simplest example, the four-point tree amplitude of scalar tachyons on the sphere. So these are closed string vertex operators. We insert them at four different points and compute the S matrix this way. I won't write out the normal ordering from now on. We already have the generative function for X correlators. And we find that we can express in terms of the exponential of the source times the Green's function times the source. G prime means that you exclude the zero mode. And it's the usual strategy of expanding in orthogonal eigenfunctions of the differential operator you're interested in for the free theory. So here we're going to plug in a four point source. We're going to put J mu equals to k's times delta functions. That way we recreate our exponentials that we're interested in for this problem. This delta function that I wasn't very explicit about before. Now we can be explicit, j0 is just this integrated against the constant zero mode. So the j0 is up to this the sum of the momenta. The c tilde I introduced before can now be called c if you include this zero mode that you get from this delta function. So bottom line is the delta function here just expresses momentum conservation. j, j, g reduces to this. We have 1, j, 1, j, and g. This is discussed in Polchinski in chapter 2. Just remember that the Green's function for the Laplacian on the complex plane is the log of the absolute value squared of the distance between the points. If we plug this in here, the log in here is going to make all this go down, so we're just going to get z differences to some powers that involve these k's. And the alpha prime came from the g here. So we see that what's going on is that we get all these different differences, and apart from these, we know that we expect to have to include 3 plus 3 ghosts that have to do with fixing positions. It's computed in three different ways in Polchinski. I'm going to argue now that you could actually have guessed that something like this must happen here. So let's use our symmetry. So the symmetry is we can fix three points. So let's fix z1, z2, and z3 to some suitable points. If we do this, we notice that this one becomes 1 because it's just 0 minus 1 absolute value. This one becomes z3, which is uh, infinite. So we don't put infinite. We just keep z3 for number. Remember, it's big. Z4 is unfixed. We only had three complex freedoms, so we have one complex number left. Same thing happens here as over here. Z3 is big. This one is now 1 minus Z4 absolute value. And then here we get this big number. So this big number that we could be a little worried about now occurs in three places. Here, here, and here. But once we take this limit, so they all become Z3, we can use momentum conservation in this form. And we add all this up of this is 1 to 4, which is minus K3 by momentum conservation. And this is the mass shell for these tachyons. But here, this is plus 4. So we see that the minus 4 from over here cancels the plus 4 from here. So we see that even if we hadn't known that we need the, this ghost correlator, we see that we understand that we need something like that to get the Jacobian to work out when we transform to these variables. Now there's this and this left. This is what we want. So let's write in terms of the Mandelstam t. 
t is 1 plus 3 momentum, we can rearrange a little bit and get this expression. So that means that k2, k4 times alpha prime is given by this kind of object. So now we have a complete answer in some sense. We have a complex integral over the complex plane of one single complex variable, which was left after we fix 3, and that's our function j. So this gives us the Virasoro pre amplitude for tachyons on the sphere on the complex plane. So how do we interpret this? This is very well explained in Polchinsky or other books. I don't need to do it here. But just to give a quick idea, this is a convenient formula for this integral. So we can express it in terms of just gamma function. There's an infinite sequence of poles in these amplitudes. The integrand can be very complicated. If you're curious, just try to plot this, for example. It has a lot of structure, but we can really learn most of what we want to know from just these expressions. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here, 4 is our integration variable, so we integrate 4 and we keep 1, 2, and 3 fixed. So if 4 approaches 2, let's say, 2 was fixed at z equals 1, then they come together, then you need to take the 2 and 4 op, and we see that this will correspond to a propagation of tachyon that has the total momentum, 2 plus 4. So we see that these two come together, and they propagate 2 plus 4 comes here. You can also do other limits, you can do 1 and 2 come together. In our case we fixed 1, 2, and 3, you could equally have fixed some of the other ones, and then you could take this limit instead. And you would have gotten this kind of expression. So we see that there's factorization, and the OP tells us that long distance propagation of a tachyon in this tube is well described by getting close to these limits. We can understand this in the original integral by seeing z4 goes to 1, is 4 goes to 2. So we see that then there will be a pole that has to do with this t channel. Now, Venetian amplitude means open string tachyons, so we get the disk from the method of images, as mentioned before. So if you take a point z, and you go to point z prime on the sphere, which is just z bar, and you identify, you get the disk with the boundary being the real line. So this is conformally equivalent to an actual disk that has, is round and has a boundary. This involution, is mapped from here to here, breaks half the symmetries of PSL2C, so we have three real parameters. Again, choose 0, 1, and infinity, but now on the real line. And so y4 is integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity. And now there are two cyclically inequivalent orderings where we switch 0 and 1. Some students have difficulty understanding this in Polchinski. He organizes them this way and says that 4 can now go here and goes past 0, goes past 1, and it goes to infinity. So it's 4 that moves around. The inequivalent ordering is if you switch 0 and 1, switch 1 and 0. So the notation looks a little funny here, but... I just mean switch these compared to that. And then you would then move 4 from here to here, from here to here, and then you're done. So you have six terms, which are formed from these two inequivalent orderings. And there was no direct analog on this on the sphere, where we could integrate over the whole complex plane. Now, if you just look at the answers you get here, the Verisaro Shapiro antigram has a function called j, and this is a similar one in Veneziano, and you find this interesting relation. So if we were sloppy, we could just say Verisaro Shapiro is roughly the square of Veneziano, but you see it's not quite true. How should we interpret this? Let's look at something more, maybe physically a little more interested than the tachyons. Three-point gauge bosons at tree level in the bosonic string. This is the problem 6.8 in Polchinski. It's very useful to do this problem at this point. To do that, you need the OP for the gauge boson vertex operators, because you also have the dx's, not just the tachyons. But these give you momenta. Polchinski explains this in chapter 2. When we contract the dx with this, we get 1k like this. And if we did all the dx's with exponentials, we get this term. These three now look pretty familiar. This looks like a Yang-Mills vertex. At this point, we haven't put any Yang-Mills gauge matrices. Doing that would just amount to multiplying this by constant gauge matrices. Now, the amazing thing is that for the closed string, you just replace alpha prime by this, and you get the amplitude for three-point graviton at tree level. So you can think of this as just an observation. Do the calculation in one case, you get this. Do the calculation in the other case, you get that. And you notice that one is just the square of the other. This is discussed in general in Polchinski. It was observed in the 80s. And recently, there's been a lot of activity with this in field theory, that maybe graviton scattering can be understood as some generalized sense of square of gauge theory. Polchinski nicely fixes the overall constants. We were worried about these functional determinants, c. Because the residue of the pole here has to be related to square of three-point vertices, you get this kind of relation. So you can actually solve this for c. So you see, when you plug this back in, the c drops out. So we can summarize our results in a string effective action at low energy. We found the S matrix is polarizations E contracted into this tensor T. We recognize these three terms as generated in the S matrix from just the Yang-Mills 
kinetic term. To reproduce this, you need to add something. So I draw it with an additional vertex here, which is a new vertex compared to the usual Yang Mills vertex from here. This cubic term turns out not to be allowed in the superstring, but f to the fourth is allowed, Riemann squared and Riemann cubed, and we'll study that later. We saw that in Boussac string, in particular, we can compute this coefficient. So it's not a free parameter. Now what about this? This is not supposed to be a free parameter. For now, you can think of it as a black box that generates this one dimensional full parameter. Also, higher corrections to this effective action will just have this one dimensional full parameter. Be patient till the superstring. Just for now, point is it can be efficient to compute things in string theory, even if you just wanted the field theory limit. We'll see that later. You can learn generic things like this idea about gravity being the square of gauge theory. We saw it even in the bosonic string, even though we know we're not going to directly interpret the bosonic string, we got this idea that we can study more. All these calculations were done with functional integrals and conformal field theory. It's a good exercise just to go through this using very basic methods in quantum mechanics, see if you can get the Veneziana amplitude, for example.